I am Maureen Ben Scooter from Austin, Texas, and this is my son, George Ben Scooter. We uh, adopted George from South Korea when he was an infant. So we met George when he was seven months old, just a cute little baby. And at the time of the adoption, we didn't know that he had any special needs. And over the next several years, um, it became clear that there was uh, that he was having delays um, and not meeting milestones, and was eventually diagnosed with having um, pretty significant autism and what's called global developmental delay. So he had delays in speech and motor and fine motor, but most significantly speech. When he was 12, he choked on a flour tortilla and cut off oxygen supply to his brain and went from being an able-bodied 12-year-old who had autism to a 12-year-old with um, who was paralyzed from the neck down, was unable to eat anymore, uh, lost the communication that he did have, um, and uh, became a... <laughs> A person, oh, yeah. a person who needs total care. It was a huge adjustment for us to go from a 12-year-old who's able-bodied and can, you know, walk and huh. run, walk and run and feed himself, to a, a child who's completely dependent on us for everything. And then our our physical home had to have adjustments made to it. So we knew uh, before we left the hospital after the accident that he was going to need nursing home level of care. I described it to people as trying to run a nursing home with a staff of one. Like, would you ever put your loved one in a nursing home that only had one staff member? You would never do that. For the last five or six years, we've had about 80 hours of nursing care in the home for George. And at the beginning of uh, the pandemic, that was still the case. So that's nurses, RNs and LVNs um, coming in to, to provide his care, bedside care. And they went to school with him as well. As the pandemic wore on and the whole field of nursing was under such um, awful stress, it started to affect the private duty nursing or the home health nursing field as well. During COVID here, in Texas, we had the snowmageddon, the, the big ice storm. In our home, we did not lose power, but the specter of that happening, and they, you know, it was just by luck that it didn't happen to us, um, made us think about you know, what would we do in those circumstances. George has is dependent on several electric powered devices, including his suction machine, the food pump that he uh, that provides all of his uh, food and water, and his hospital bed. Each of those devices has an internal battery that is charged. Each of them can run for about four hours without electricity. But you know, here in Austin, people went days without electricity. So if we started doing some planning around that, one was to make sure that we were able to um, communicate that we understood where to look for the information that had things like warming centers that were open, or I know in Austin there, they would open a school, if there was a school with power, specifically for people who had medical devices that needed to be charged. I have never been survivalist, but now I, uh, you know, I think about that more. Um, how would, how would my family survive for four or five days without water and electricity? Because, um, you know, it happened in the not too distant uh, past. So I now have a um, a go bag of emergency supplies uh, for George. I keep bottles of water available for the whole family. I don't know if I have enough for, you know, four or five days, but I've got some. I could at least uh, keep George hydrated if we lost water again. Um, and then I thought long and hard about a power supply. I looked around and, um, and did some research and our goal was not to like run the refrigerator or power the whole house, but what I absolutely need to do for George is to power that bed, that suction, that, that um, food pump. I, you know, I've got three or four devices I need to get power to, at least on an intermittent basis. And I um, found out about these lithium ion big batteries that you can get and um, keep charged. And it's a little uh, a system and you can plug devices directly into the system. So I went to our um, Medicaid provider and said, George, is his life 
is dependent on having access to electricity and we don't need a generator, which uh, costs $4,000, but I have found this battery device for $700 that would serve our purposes. And the care coordinator I was talking to said, well, we've never had a request for one of those and we've never gotten approval. But, uh, you know, I asked and she talked to me and she said, well, what, how, you know, one of the details of how would you use it exactly? And uh, we went back and forth several times and then she took it to her manager and she got it approved. So if I could, um, tell parents one thing about being ready for an, an emergency, it would probably be two things. <laughs> and one is to have a go bag ready in case you have, in case of a flood or fire and you have to evacuate quickly. The other thing that I would say is have some form of medical record available and either on your child's wheelchair or on them somehow or uh, easily by the front door that you can grab because many of us have kids who have who are unable to speak for themselves so they're not going to be able to communicate with a emergency responder and they may have complicated medical histories and may be on multiple medications and they it just can be quite complicated and so to have a medical summary or even like what we use is our daily log sheet that we keep by the bed which has all of his medications and the times that we give him and um, you know records of his daily habits and things like that so that in an emergency if i'm not there uh, to tell someone, and George is unable to tell a, a responder, um, or I just don't have time to grab anything else. I can grab that and go, and it gives some, and it gives a provide an emergency responder or an ER uh, physician somewhere to start. Advice that I would give other parents is based on my experience, for instance, with um, getting a battery power pack, is ask. You know, our Medicaid providers, if you have Medicaid, our Medicaid providers may not be aware that there's a product out there that could save your child's life in the event of, a, of an emergency. And what we found was that we asked and we had, you know, we'd had the information and we went back and forth and they might say yes.